Thank you, ladies. Didn't y'all enjoy that? Amen. I tell you, I don't know about y'all. Have you noticed the pollen lately? Boy, I tell you what, it comes and goes, doesn't it? We'll have a week where everything seems fine, and then you get up the next day, your eyes are all swollen. And uh, I was reading the other day that you need to, and, and we all know this. It's not like it's news, but uh, they talk about finding local honey. And uh, maybe that'll help. I used to do some of that several years back, but uh, uh, then if you uh, have an insulin problem, you can't be eating honey all. <laughs> but you're supposed to take a little bit of your local bee honey and take it to try to build up your resistance uh, to some of the uh, allergies that come about in the pollen season. Now, uh, we, we thank God for the great weather. We continue to pray for rain. You know, it's kind of dry. Have you noticed that? And uh, when the weeds don't grow very fast, you know it's dry. I was told that in my front yard, I... Somebody, one of my, well, my son told me I had the best looking yard of weeds in the neighborhood. <laughs> I keep them cut and green. <laughs> so, keep the, I want my weeds to look good. And uh, so we're looking at the Gospel of John, chapter number 13. And, of course, we've talked about uh, in the last couple of three weeks on uh, what it is to be a disciple. And uh, uh, last time we met a couple of weeks ago, uh, our message was on uh, the essentials of a disciple. Number one was that he had to be a receptive learner. And we talked about the teacher, the Lord Jesus, the text, the Word of God, and then the test, the trial of our faith. And so those three uh, issues we looked at tonight, we want to look at another requirement uh, for a disciple, and we're going to find that in John chapter number 13 and verse number 35. He says, By this shall all men know ye, that ye are my disciples, if you have love, if you love one another. Now, the word essential, when we use that, I, I, I kind of hesitate using that word because it's not necessarily one that uh, permeates our vocabulary all the time. But we know this, it means something that's absolutely necessary, something that you might call indispensable or basic. Uh, let's just put it this way. Air is essential for the lungs. Light is essential for the eyes. And blood is essential for the heart. And so it is essential for the disciple to love one another. Now that's not always easy to do. But the truth is, it is a command the Lord Jesus gives us. Because... Uh, uh, it is really reflecting who our master, our Lord is. We, uh, he loved us, and if we're going to be a follower of him, uh, he says you ought to love one another. Now, he getting ready to go back to heaven. Of course, the crucifixion is right near this uh, message he was given to his disciples. He knows that the cross is very close, and then in, in just a... A few days after that, he'll ascend to heaven. And so he gathers them, get them together, and he's instructing them how to be students of himself. And then in that instruction, he says, I've got a commandment for you. Now, really, this is the only commandment. Of course, the commandment, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And then he says, the other commandment is that you love one another. So uh, he taught a lot, the Lord Jesus, and he instructed his disciples incredibly in many, many subjects, uh, but his commandments were few. But this is one of them, that you love one another. Now, why would he say that? Why would it be necessary? Well, the world needs to identify something special, the sinner does, 
that makes him different, uh, makes the disciple different from other people. Of course, we know the world is a place of hate. The world hates. Look at the vitriol going on tonight. Uh, the college campuses. Uh, do you ever look at that and say, you know, those are those student loans that were just forgiven. <laughs> and now there they are. Uh, it's like we pay for that with our tax money to hear people say death to America. Uh, how upside down are we? Uh, they ought to call the loans in on every one of those and help them buy a ticket. Uh, one way, coach. <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking, is this what we've come to? Uh, uh, you know, I, I am uh, I am amazed at the the uh, theology of the anti-America uh, uh, student. He and it is a theology. They teach him a way of thought, and uh, uh, of course we're imperialist colonialist, and we're guilty of wrecking everybody's life and coming and living in this country. Why, everybody was doing fine before we got here. Uh, you know, they, uh, they were one with nature, is what they say. Uh, now, if you go study uh, or visit some of the American, Native American grounds that uh, are in existence in this country, you'll find that in their own history, uh, there was wars and wars and wars going on between themselves. Uh, in fact, uh, they had certain times of the year they set aside just a war. <laughs> uh, they just loved it. They, and one group would try to run the other group off their lands, and the other group would at times be successful to running them uh, miles away, if not states away, and then there was constant hatred amongst the groups. And somehow that was, as the new revisionists try to rewrite history, they want to give us the impression that when we arrived, we ruined everything. And they're very dishonest about what really was going on. In fact, uh, so the world's always been full of hate. Sinners without God uh, have hate. They don't just hate one another, they hate God. And they hate the people of God. And so when the Lord Jesus was trying to teach his disciples a way of life that would make them stand out as different from the average sinner, he says, by this, Shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another? Now, you say that to an independent Baptist and he has a hard time filtering that through. See, there's some of us uh, in, by nature, you know, I had a guy tell me this week, uh, he got saved in an independent Baptist church and uh, in his early days, he fell into what many of us have seen, the, the anger and the frustration with each other and at times the rejection of each other. And this young convert came up and everywhere he went, every independent Baptist church he went to, they were going through, and he found this situation. He found it because he was controversial and a lot of this he brought on himself. But he came up and declared to me after 45 years, he was no longer an independent Baptist. And I said, what are you? He said, I don't rightly know. <laughs> he said, I know I'm saved. <laughs> but you know, it has been sad. It's a sad history amongst not just Baptists, but all church people. There's been a lot over the years where there was certainly a uh, disobedient to this particular commandment. And that's the very commandment that's left us uh, for us to be able to reflect who our Lord was. Remember, Paul, the apostle, wrote in Romans, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he gave us an example. We 
were the ungodly. We were without strength and without hope, but yet Christ died and gave himself for us. So uh, he's our example, and yet he has to command us uh, not to have anger and hatred and bitterness one to another. Now, you know what happens to a lost man, and you've heard this before. If you've been out, if you've witnessed over your Christian lifetime, you'll always hear, I know about those people down there at the church. Boy, they fight and butcher each other, and they talk bad about each other and always complaining about each other. Yeah, them church people. They, they expect God's people to love one another. A lost man does. A few... Uh, but so many of them have used the uh, anger and the uh, diffusions and the confusions that have gone on in local churches. They've used that as a proof to themselves that there's nothing authentic about the people in that church. Not so, the Lord says. I want you to present yourself as authentic followers of me. And the way you do that is you show love one to another, genuine love, to offset the personal hate that goes on in the world. Now, the world has uh, no excuse themselves. You're talking about hatred. Uh, the world accepts that it hates each other within the sinner's world. They will gather together in a small group and build a clientele and love each other. I mean, the... the uh, the kids at the uh, fraternity in college, you know, they'll, they'll pretend to gather together to love each other, but at the same time, they'll beat each other out of job, relationships, <laughs> stick each other in the back. That's, that's common there. In, in, the, in the work world, uh, the world knows that it's common practice to try to undo somebody else in the workplace. In fact, they climb the ladder and they use the phrase you climbed it on the backs of others because <laughs> it's just commonplace. There's not a lot of love going on down there. Now I'll grant you there's some uh, people who have acquaintances and over the years they learn to appreciate each other but that's a small percentage of what really goes on. It's just a little bit. Uh, it, it's always been that way. And it's, it's so the Lord Jesus said that these interpersonal relationships uh, of the disciples will prove to the lost that they've been changed by the power of God. You see, man generally doesn't love each other, but when you get saved, God changes you and gives you the ability to love one another. And so look in verse 34. It is a love that's demanded. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now, we call that uh, a divine equation. Uh, a plus B equals C type of thing. Hey, God loved us as he loved us. We ought to love one another. And if we do, all men shall know you are my disciples. That's the equation. You get it like that. Now, how, and somebody says, he's commanding us. He's demanding us tonight to love one another. Now, we know that we don't have the same personalities. And we don't always see things eye to eye. But in God's plan, those things should be minimalized and the thing that should be held up in high esteem is your genuine love and concern about your fellow brother and sister in Christ. And you think about the history of Christianity. I mean, there are sometimes where those who profess Christ would end up going to war with each other down through church history and kill each other and count themselves to be doing God a favor. And uh, sometimes it was over very small things. Uh, uh, one thing back in, uh, you know, it's always good to get into some church history. Uh, it, it amazes me 
back in medieval times and in pre-medieval times, uh, all the people that were calling Christ their Savior were willing to kill each other over something that is not essential to their salvation doctrine. Now that's not unusual because in the Civil War right here in America, both sides claim to be on God's side. And uh, I have a book uh, that uh, someone gave me several, a couple, three years ago. It's a seven, 800 page book, but if you get in there and read it, you'll get the letters from some of, some of the Civil War soldiers and the officers. And if you read what they were saying, uh, all of them thought they were fighting for God and all of them thought they were right and all of them read and quoted the same Bible and all of them prayed uh, 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 amongst themselves and then they went out and shot each other. <laughs> I mean, it's like, how did that happen? I mean, you know, and, and yet it, it, it caused what it caused and it did what it did. Listen to this, Romans 5, 5. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The reason why the Lord Jesus can demand that we love one another is because he has provided us with a gift that enable us to do and obey the commandment. He said, I'm giving to you the love of God, the pure divine love of God, and I'm going to shed it abroad, pour it out on your heart, which will enable you to obey my commandment, which by nature you can't do. Without the love of God, we couldn't even love one another. Now, we could love some. We could pick the ones we want to love. And that's generally what we do. But... Uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to shed abroad or cover the group with a love unless it was divine love that was operating in us. And he says, Paul says, it, it, it was God that did that. And he shed it abroad. Now, with a gift, of course, there's responsibility. When God gives a gift out, which is his love, the gift of the love of God, when he gives it out, he he requires responsibility. He doesn't just give us a gift for our own uh, esteem. He gives us a gift for the service of others. Every gift in the New Testament given to a believer is for the service of others. If you've got a, a gift of music and God's given you that ability, it is for the service of others. Uh, it is not for uh, just to fulfill your own needs. It's for God to bless others with it. If you have the gift of teaching, it is for the service of others. It's not to, you know, when you get some of the uh, scholars so enamored with their own ability, uh, they begin to look down on others and look at others as incapable. That's not the gift of, of teaching. The gift of teaching is a humbled servant gift. It is, it is for the edification of the saints and the work of the ministry. And so when he gives a gift, he expects us to be responsible with it and he literally describes it as shedding abroad. It has the same sense of you taking a, a pitcher of water and you got a little plant and you pour the whole bucket of water in your little pot covering the whole thing when you could really just give them a little bit right at the root system would be adequate. But what we do, we pour the whole thing in there. That's called shedding abroad the love of God. And so he gives us that responsibility. And of course, when we have a responsibility with the gift that he has enabled us with, uh, we got an accountability. We have to answer for it. And one day the Bible says we're all going to give an account unto God. Uh, for the deeds done in the flesh. Truth is, the book of James, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We have to account for the gift 
and our responsibility in fulfilling it. And that's when he says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that you love one another. I heard about this little girl who came home from Sunday school. I think she was a five-year-old, and uh, she came home and told her mother, Mother, we learned the verse that we should love one another. And she quoted, tried to quote this particular verse we're studying tonight. And her mother says, Honey, do you know what those words mean? That we should love one another as God has loved us? And she goes, Well, Mama, it's kind of like this. You see, God is number one, and we ought to love number one. And we are number two. And then we ought to love all the number twos. And if we love number one right and love number two rights, then everybody gets loved. And I thought, yeah, you know, that may be simplistic. But the little girl had it right. Loving God with all our heart. And then we're able to obey him and fulfill the responsibility and be accountable because of the gift he's poured out in us. So we become a vessel. And as the Apostle Paul said, a vessel meet for the master's use. Now every vessel is not ready to be used. Uh, you've picked up uh, some buckets or some water pitchers or something. And when you filled them up, you looked and uh, those coffee cups back in the fellowship hall. Uh, if you drink enough coffee or hang around here enough, you're going to find that in about every stack of styrofoam coffees, you're going to find two or three that's got pinholes. <laughs> I seem to find them regularly. I, I'll pour me a cup of the coffee, and then I'll set it down, and then I go back to get it, and I look, and coffee's all over the desk or all over the table, and it just shoots out. And, and so some of those cups are unworthy shouldn't be used. I, I find myself from time to time doubling it up. People say, why do you do that? Well, because I've had enough leak on me that I don't trust any of them. If not only that, you know what happens and other things that you got to watch out for those styrofoams is the, as the factory cuts them, they'll leave a, a hump in the bottom and you set it down and then the thing wobbles on you. <laughs> so you can't, listen, some of those vessels are unworthy. Now, a child of God who has got leaks in him, he's got some humps in the place where it ought to be straight, uh, he may not be able to fulfill the commandment that God gives him. He, he's held accountable for it, but sad to say, sometimes uh, he won't be able to get it done. And I think that's why sometimes you'll find folks who, even in church, they'll find them crude and rude and angry and bitter and walking around half mad all the time. First uh, church I came to be a youth pastor in, there was a one fella who, uh, he, uh, he just was cantankerous. I, I, he got up mad every day. I, I assumed he, he never was happy. Gripe, gripe, gripe about everything. I mean, he griped about everything. So the first day I, I got there, the pastor took me off and said, now listen, be careful with old brother so-and-so. He's mad all the time. And so uh, he said, uh, just get used to it. And it didn't take long, and sure enough, uh, I went out and visited a bus route with him, and the whole time I was with this guy, he griped about everything. He griped about the bus. He griped about the pastor. He griped about the other deacons. He griped about, he griped about everything. He came in, he griped about the thermostat. He griped about the pew. He griped about uh, the way the programs were. He, he, and in all of my time I knew him, in four years, I can truthfully say I never heard him say a nice thing about anybody. Now, was he saved? Yeah, I believe he was. I know he had a good testimony, but somewhere along the way, he got to where he became a vessel that wasn't meat for the master's use. He sprung a leak or he got a hump in him. And God 
requires us to be ready to be used. And he says, you can't get away from it. I'm giving you this order. I'm demanding it, and I can do it, God says, because I've given you the gift to enable you to do it. You have in you my love, the same love I showed you when you were unlovely. The same love I showed you when you were against me. I shed my love, I commended my love towards you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So all of these things he lays out clearly before us. It's a divine love. It's not the kind, you know, we Americans, we, we, we throw love around about everything. We love our dogs. We love our pets. We love, you know, we love the sunset. Oh, I just love it. We love the, that ball game. We love that ball game. I mean, we use the word love about everything, which kind of makes us callous to the word. I, don't, I think we throw it around more probably than any other culture. Uh, in the ancient cultures, of course, they, uh, they had a variety of words uh, to demonstrate the quality or the quantity of a particular love. Uh, we, of course, we use the word fond, we're fond, or uh, sometimes we use uh, the word uh, we're affection. But the way they, most of the world used love, it was love in proportion to that situation. They would uh, say in, in Greek, uh, in, in, in Greece, in ancient Greece, that they had uh, a love for things. They had a certain word they used about a love for things. And then they had another word they used about uh, love in relationships. And then they had another word they used when it became uh, a sensual love. But they had one word that was reserved to describe a God like love. And of course we know the word agape. It's thrown around. That was the intense uh, word used only to describe a love that was like as the love God gave us. And so when we talk about you ought to love one another, he's not talking about love for things or he's not talking about love even uh, for relationships. He's not even talking about love uh, for uh, uh, intimacy between a husband and wife. He's talking about a love that only God has. And God says, I've given you that. Now use it effectively with responsibility and being accountable to be obedient unto me. All of these things are spelled out as we think about discipleship. It's, it's a selfless love. Matthew 20, 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The truth is, the kind of love God gave up is not a selfish love. It's, you know, most of the time we use love, it's about what it does for us. You know, but in the love of God, it was for others. The kind of love he has was to reach out to others. He gave his life a ransom for many. He said, I didn't come here to, the Lord Jesus said, I didn't come here to be ministered to. He deserved it. It was his, the honor and worship of the people. But he humbled himself to show us the kind of love, selfless love, to be demonstrated so that we would learn and follow. It was sacrificial love. Look at chapter number 15, one page over, verse number 12 and 13. Chapter 15 of John, verse 12 and 13, he, he repeats it. This is my commandment. There it is. That you love one another. Hinging on that as, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life. For his friends. Now, sacrificial love is something special. 
Do you know, I uh, saw that illustrated in a ship of, uh, of Ireland or called the Empress of Ireland. It was a ship built and was a fairly large ship uh, pr prior to the Titanic. And this ship was making its maiden voyage from uh, Quebec across the Atlantic Ocean to land in Liverpool, England. There were 1,400 and something passengers on that ship. And they took off, all was well, but in a foggy night, somehow, and I don't know how this happens in a big ocean, but it happens even today with all the GPS and coordinates. Another ship rammed them. They collided out in that big ocean. I think they were on the shipping lanes, but... But anyway, this other ship, they had a name for it. Uh, it hit the side and crushed the side of that ship called the Empress of Ireland, and it sank it. And there were over a 1,000 people drowned. On that ship was 149 Salvation Army workers. And as they began to finally recover the bodies, there were 412 survived out of 1,400. They began to recover the bodies. They found that every one of the salvation workers, 129 of them, did not have a life jacket on. And the witnesses related the story that as the ship was going down, that every Salvation Army worker took their life vest off and gave it to others on the ship. And they said this to them, we're ready to meet the Lord, but we know you're not. And they gave away their vest. And that, of course, that event caused hundreds of people later on to be saved when they heard of the fact that they would lay their life down for sinners? What a testimony. But the commandment that God gives his people is not necessarily lay your life down for a sinner. He say lay your life down, be willing to, for others within the body of Christ. That all men shall know you are my disciples. Because the way you cherish each other, the way you look at each other, the way you feel for each other, the way you suffer with each other, and the way you rejoice with each other, you're connected intertwinedly because God's love has been invested in you and you're enabled to pour it out on the people of God. Now, that's why in another place it says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, especially them of the household of faith. God's people need to take care of God's people first. And uh, then we're enabled to reach out to those. Now, thank God it enables us to shed abroad the love of God outside the body. We, the reason we do and we're about to do uh, the uh, Safe Harbor Pregnancy Center fundraiser, uh, it is a way that we want to help those who are without Christ. They need help. Uh, we believe in that. We believe in charitable giving. Uh, that's why we do uh, the Manna Food Bank. Uh, Awana has it. That's why we all bring food we do it to help those who aren't able, apparently, to help themselves. That's why we support uh, Waterfront Rescue Mission, not only in, uh, in service at times, but also financially, because we believe it's right to help others. But primarily, and the number one group that we're supposed to help 
is the people of God. That's why we like to help the missionaries. That's why we want to support them. That's why uh, we help those who print the Bibles. All of these things are ways for us to exhibit what God has done for us when he gave his love within our hearts. Before we were saved, we weren't too concerned. Most unsaved people are thinking about only one person, themselves. <laughs> it's all about me. All of these things. And so as we look tonight, we'll get ready to close out. Uh, he had a sacrificial love. He showed us with a steadfast love in John 13. He loved them, the Bible says in John 13, 1, I believe it. Uh, he loved them. The very last ver uh, part of the verse of uh, the first verse of the chapter 13 of John, he loved them unto the end. That's called steadfast love. That's love that doesn't turn on and off. That's love that exhibits itself constantly. It's displayed. He says, as I've loved ye, love others. So it's not something we ought to say, I have a secret love in my heart for the people of God. If only they knew <laughs> how much I love them. Oh, there's sister so-and-so broke down on the side of the road. I don't want to get involved. I'm going to keep on going. <laughs> you know, uh, I've had uh, a number of homeless come up here, and, and uh, they love to, they do this, you know. They'll also say, one guy came up not long ago and told me, you know, God told me uh, that you're supposed to give me $20. And I said, well, he didn't say a thing to me about it. You'd have thought he had said something to me. <laughs> and he sent a guy, he said, you, you know, you're supposed to take care of the people of God. And he cussed in the middle of it. And I'm thinking, okay, if I knew you were truly the people of God, I'd be glad to help you. But uh, uh, looking at what I was seeing, it, it, the evidences were the opposite of anything that we would know. But, uh, but truly, uh, you know, if God lays it on your heart sometime and you see a brother or sister in need, it doesn't have to be financial. You know, and, and I'll tell you, I'm preaching to the choir tonight because y'all do it. Y'all take care of people. I have to say that. I, I always get these reports, people, so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. Hey, listen, I'm thrilled. It's a way of showing other people you love. You visit, you send cards, you provide meals, you help uh, take people here and there and you, you, uh, you do everything you can to help encourage when you can. And uh, that is the way God expects us to treat one another. Well, we've run out of time. And uh, all the people of God said, amen. You didn't have to do that. You didn't show me love by doing that. <laughs> but uh, uh, we'll, Lord willing, we'll continue. We want to look next week on what it is to be mature, a mature disciple. There's some absolute uh, things that are laid out on how uh, to know that you're growing in grace. Well, let's ask the Lord's blessing on the service as we continue to leave and also be protected uh, as you go. And you got to be careful. You know, Wednesday night they had a shooting right down here at the corner not long after you left church. In fact, I think it was at 8.35 or 8.40. Right down there, a couple of guys uh, apparently weren't getting along too well. And in today's America, if you don't get along, they just take guns out and shoot each other. Yeah. I'm thinking, there's not been a Wild West television show that equates to what they could do today. This is the Wild South right now. And so they, uh, they, uh, they did shoot at each other. So... There's always a need to pray for the safety of God's people and the protection. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, we come to you and thank you for uh, your word, your admonishment. May we be practical in it. And, and Lord, may we publish the good tidings of great joy. Uh, be with us, protect us, bring us back together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.